this is going to be an emotional talk, both for me and hopefully for you. <laughs> We're going to talk about personal experiences. And as I go through things, I want you to try to think about your own lives and, and the situations you've been in. And the first one we're going to talk about is going to the hairdresser. Going to the hairdresser for most of us can be every, everything from annoying to um, a little bit scary because you're not sure how your hair is going to turn out. But for one part of our society, going to the hairdresser has often been throughout their lives a very complicated matter. For transgender people, when they, did, when they start coming into that identity, changing your hair is one of the simplest ways, easiest ways, to change your gender expression. But very often, they're met both by their family members and by their hairdresser as saying, oh, you don't want to look like a girl, do you? Or, no, that's a boy's cut. You're going to look like a boy. Of course, that was the point, right? <laughs> but even worse, trans men, going to the hairdresser can be, end up in something even worse. They can be verbally or physically assaulted by the hairdresser. And this has happened several times, where uh, trans men go to the hairdresser to get a haircut, and the hairdresser thinks that they're there to try to get a cheaper haircut, because haircuts for men are cheaper than haircuts for women. This actually means that a lot of transgender people, they don't go to the hairdresser for both of these reasons, and they would rather cut each other's hair. Planning a vacation. Most of us like planning a vacation. It's sort of like a virtual vacation. You can get to like imagine how it is to go on vacation many places. And you can think about, OK, is, is there a beach? Is it kid friendly? Um, is it expensive? Would you, I like to eat the food there? But for same-sex couples, and also for transgender people, planning a vacation involves trying to figure out, if we go there, could we get assaulted? Could we get killed? Could we be jailed? Large parts of the world are not accessible to go on vacation for same-sex couples and transgender people because of this. The talk is called Deconstructing Privilege, and it's basically all about trying to, re for all of us to realize that we experience life in a certain way, but other people might experience it in a totally different way. And that means also that the conclusions that we've formed throughout our lives don't necessarily map to other people's lives, because they have a different lived experience than we do. So my name is Patricia Oz. I am uh, currently a consultant in my own company. I have been a C++ programmer for about 13 years. I've worked on uh, a couple of browsers. Um, and I also helped form Hash Include. But before we start talking about privilege, I'd like to talk about the four stages of competence. Now, most of you are probably familiar about the four stages of competence, but I'm just going to go through it anyway. So the idea is that you start off in this unconscious incompetence. This is what people call the unknown unknowns. You don't know that you don't know. Uh, often people will say that people in this stage, they are ignorant. But this is, we are all ignorant of some things, right? Uh, everyone is in different stages in different areas of their lives. The problem with this stage, though, is that you think you know. You have an intuition, and you believe that that intuition is right. And the problem with this is that you have actual, absolutely no incentive to move beyond this point, because you think you, you have it sorted out. But if you manage to get out of this, then you move over to conscious incompetence. In conscious incompetence, you, everybody's been there, right? That's when you start to learn about a topic and then you realize exactly how little you knew. <laughs> it's, it's that when you actually started learning something and you feel dumber than you did before you started. That's this stage. And in this case, you're, you're, you're learning at least, but you're still, you have the wrong analysis because you still are not informed. 
But as you learn more and as you become competent, then you move into conscious competence. This is a very good stage for most people because this is also where you can teach. Uh, because you have a, a conscious uh, relationship to your knowledge, and so it makes it possible for you to teach it to others. In this case, you have a right analysis. But the last column, and this is a problematic one, uh, because oftentimes it is not possible to move into the last column. And this is where you have unconscious competence. This is, this is very similar in, in personal experience. It's very similar to the first column. You have like a feeling. <laughs> it feels wrong in some way. And you can't necessarily put your finger on what's wrong, but you have this intuition. The problem is that it's very hard to distinguish whether or not you are actually unconsciously incompetent or unconsciously competent. So I'll give you an example. Swearing in foreign language. It's a good example because most people have done this. <laughs> so you can think that if you are unconsciously incompetent in a language, then swearing in a foreign language is fun. It's like you, have, you generally have a foreign language where you know under 10 words, at least some of those words will be swear words. And, <laughs> and then, you know, it's kind of fun to, to use those words. And it, everyone, it's something you do since we're, we were children, right? But then after you learn more of the language and you start practicing and things like that, then you go like, oh, maybe that's offensive. Maybe I shouldn't say this. Uh, but you're still not really sure. So your analysis is still a little bit wrong here. But moving into conscious competence, you're fluent in this language now and you know this is definitely offensive. You know intellectually that this is definitely offensive. But one thing that is very important to distinguish this from the last column here is that if, you are, if this is your native language, first of all, you have a tendency to express yourself in a different way. You'll, instead of saying this is definitely offensive, you'll say something like, that's rude, or you don't say that. But another thing is that studies have shown that if you are a native speaker of a language and someone swears around you, your cortisol levels rise. People have a different relationship to their own native language than they do to a language they've learned. And crossing this boundary, and the reason why I bring it up, is crossing the boundary between conscious competence and unconscious competence is very difficult. So I would say, especially for this topic today, to aim, hopefully, in the end, for conscious competence. But my goal for this talk is actually just to bring us to conscious incompetence. So if we're going to look at privilege, right? You could think that in the first... In, unconscious incompetence, you might say privilege is a myth. And that generally comes to, I don't believe that this exists because it doesn't happen to me. And very often you will see that in many cases where, where um, someone will say, this person harassed me, and then somebody else will say, this person has always been nice to me. <laughs> this is the idea that your experience maps to other people. Moving into conscious incompetence, then you say privilege might be real. I don't know, possibly. And then conscious competence will go like privilege is real. But moving into conscious incompetence is funny because the language changes. Uh, unconscious competence, I mean. Your language changes. You'll say things like your privilege is showing. It's, it's a totally different way of talking. And, and that is often what you will see, that when you encounter people who are are unconsciously competent in something. They speak, they talk about it in a different way. But the good thing is, if we manage to move into conscious incompetence, we end up listening to people because we're learning, right? But let's go back to the beginning. Because I keep talking about privilege, but I haven't really explained what privilege is or what I mean when I say privilege. And before that, we need to talk about hardship. Because most people have experienced hardship in their lives. Many people have experienced horrible things or are going through horrible things, living right next to you and you don't even know. Your colleague on the next desk might have 
terrible pains they're going through that you don't know about. Not everything shows and not everything is spoken about. But privilege is being spared a particular hardship. And that is important to realize that when someone says that you have certain privilege, it doesn't mean your life is great. It just means that this specific thing, you didn't get that. This hardship, this specific type of hardship, you get, didn't get that in addition to all of the other things. Do you worry about which pronoun you use for your partner? When you're at work and you're sitting over lunch and you're talking about what you're going to do this weekend, or maybe your partner made you dinner yesterday, do you worry about one day you're going to say the wrong pronoun? A lot of people in same-sex relationships who are not out at work worry about this every day. Because if one day they say the wrong thing, then everyone's going to know. And especially in our business, but probably in money businesses, homophobia is rampant. But not only that, in many countries, being in a same-sex relationship is against the law. And even in countries where it's not against the law, it might cause people to harass you or assault you. Has anyone at work ever asked you how you have sex with your partner? This is kind of crazy. You'd think that nobody would ever ask this question. Two groups of people get this question a lot. Transgender people get this question a lot. Transgender people get this question so much, they're tired of hearing it. It's like on the top of, of the list of things they don't want to hear anymore. But another group that also gets this question are disabled people, especially people who are in a wheelchair or in, and otherwise physically disabled visibly in some way. And this is a question most of us have never ever had in our lives. And these people experience this question at work. Has anyone at work ever commented on your weight? Said that, you know what, you're getting a little bit overweight. Maybe you should uh, lose a couple of pounds. Or, or do you, are you going to eat all of that? It's become socially acceptable to comment on, on people's weight, especially for people who are overweight, but also for people who are underweight. And oftentimes, you don't know anything about their lives. You don't know why things are the way they are. Sometimes there could be a medical issue. A lot of times, there's a lot of emotional history here. Has anyone at work ever asked you what your genitalia looks like? Now, this is pretty crazy, right? It's like, how, how would you even do that? I mean, you just like kind of walk up to somebody and it's like, hi, John, excuse me, <laughs> I was wondering. This is yet again a question that happens a lot to transgender people. People want to know what their genitalia looks like and feel entitled to that information and ask them. Again, another question that transgender people are very tired of hearing that we've never heard. Has anyone ever shushed you in a meeting? This happens to women a lot. Uh, I've, I've been the only female programmer in a bunch of teams, and I have never seen a man be shushed. <laughs> I have been shushed so many times. I have seen men do crazy stuff in meetings. I've seen men throw things. I've seen men scream. I've seen men bang the table. I've seen them. <laughs> jump up and down, never been shushed, no, not once. Do you think I did any of those things? Mm-mm, because -mm. women can't. We'll get back to that. Are you expected to always be meek and accommodating? Again, something that happens a lot to women. Women are expected to be communal. We're expected to take care of everybody. We're supposed to take care of their feelings and make sure nobody's upset. 
It also means that a lot of what they call office housework often falls on women. It, and women will often do it also to make sure nobody gets upset. Often housework is things like taking notes in meetings, uh, making sure there's coffee, arranging outings, things like that. Are certain jobs unavailable to you because of language or accent? This is something that hits very hard, and we've seen it also recently, uh, for people who move to another country for work. So if you move to another country for work, you found a place to work where they speak English, so you can have that job, but, but let's say that other jobs in that country might be difficult for you to get because you don't speak the language of that country. You end up being trapped at your employer because if you lose your job, you lose your residency and you have to go home. This also means that you become even more vulnerable to workplace harassment because you have nowhere to go. And if your employer knows that or your team members know that, then this can be used as a way of pushing you further than they would have pushed anybody else. Do people ridicule you as a parent because of your gender? This is something that happens to men a lot. For some reason, it has become socially acceptable to make fun of men as parents. Making fun of men saying that, you know, they can't dress their kids or they can't feed their kids or hey, even they can't cook. A lot of men today want to have an active relationship with their, with their children. They want to be active parents and they participate in their children's lives on equal footing with the mother. But still, they are discriminated against on almost every part of society. They can bring their children to the doctor, but then afterwards the doctor will call the mother to say what's wrong. And this is very painful for very many men and not something that we talk about. Do you get time off for your religious holidays? When I wrote this talk, I asked my husband this question, and he said no, because he's an atheist. <laughs> In Norway, we get like Christian holidays off. Unfortunately, if that's not your religion, you still get those off. And, you know, that's, that's maybe not so bad, but what if you have other religious holidays? Do you get those off? Do you get double pay if you work on your religious holidays? Do people refuse to use your name and instead use a painful name, like a bully name, something that somebody called you when you were a child? This happens to transgender people a lot. They call it dead naming. It's when people refuse to use their new chosen name and instead insist on using the name that they were given by their parents. A related concept to dead naming is misgendering. It's people refusing to use their pronouns by, or identifying them with the gender that they identified themselves. Both of, both of these things are extremely painful. And it also seeps into our work, because what happens if you transition at work? And dead naming is something that is painful to you, because our names are encoded in our work. If you go and you look at your Git history, you will find your old name everywhere. New people entering the team will go and look in the Git log and say, who is this person? Again, also, the fact that people know that you are transgender could be dangerous to you. Have you ever worried about whether you could attend an event at all? These are really beautiful steps, but you really only need one step before someone in a wheelchair can't enter. But you also have things like maybe it's in a shady neighborhood, maybe it's late at night. A lot of women 
are very particular about what they will attend of professional events. And not only because of the neighborhood or whether it's late at night, but also because if there's alcohol involved, then all women know that the risk of being sexually harassed, harassed increases dramatically. And being sexually harassed is bad in many ways. It's bad because what happened is bad, but it's also bad because you have to work with this person afterwards. And you'd think that would be the end of it. It's like that is also bad. But it's even worse because this person will remember or be told that they did this thing and now be either, and this is very interesting, they'll either be very ashamed and don't want to talk to you, but very often you will find that they will be angry at you because they harassed you. I don't know how that works, but I'm assuming it's, an, it's just some kind of defense mechanism. And what you will often find is that they'll avoid you. And so now any project that they're in, they will try to exclude you. And suddenly the fact that somebody sexually harassed you means that you are excluded from work. Has anyone ever asked you if you belonged in an event? This happens a lot to women. But it happens also to, to people of color. Very often you will see at an event that the only people of color there are often working. And so, uh, so then you will have someone who is attending the event as an attendee. And being a person of color, people will assume that they are in some kind of working capacity. I, I spoke to someone who said that he, he, uh, he watched uh, a woman doing something at the stage and he, and he almost said to her, you know, maybe you should move over because the next speaker is about to appear. And it turned out this woman was the speaker. Women and people of color keep on being asked these questions, you know, like, oh, so are you from sales? Are you from HR? Do you work here? everyone assuming that you don't belong here. And this is an example of what is often called microaggressions. These are the little things that just keep on happening again and again and again. And you try to kind of, it doesn't feel like you should make a big deal out of it the first like 15, 20, 80 times. But at a certain point, it just grinds you down. Have you ever had your visa denied? Currently, even if you're accepted as a speaker in the US or in Europe, if you're from almost any part of Africa, getting a visa is almost impossible. Which means that you can't even attend a conference as a speaker. Do you trust the police? A lot of white people have a tendency to want to call the police when something happens. But suddenly you will find that a lot of people of color don't find that to be a, such a good idea. They'd rather just get out and not tell anybody. And that's because a lot of places in the world, the police are dramatically more dangerous to people who are not white. That is often more dangerous to call the police than to work it out on your own. So examples of privilege. You have your sexual orientation. The heteronormative culture, as they say it, the heterosexual idea of love has taken over the world. All of, all of uh, popular media depicts this all of the time. Then you have gender identity. Uh, which gender do you identify with? If you identify with the gender that you had when you were born, or that you were assigned at birth, um, then people will call you cisgender. If you don't identify with your, the, the gender you were assigned at birth, people call you transgender. But then you have your gender. Uh, most times, being a man will give you more privilege than being a woman. But as we saw in the case of parents, that's not true. In the case of parents, women 
are given a lot more credibility as a parent than a man. Then you have things like racial or ethnic privileges. Being white, generally, in the Western world, means you, you escape a lot of harassment. You, there's a lot of things that just don't happen to you. And that is one of the things that is very hard about this, the concept of privilege, is that it's a non-event. Being privileged doesn't mean that you feel good. It just means that something bad didn't happen. It's very hard to pay attention to bad things that don't happen. It's very hard as a white person to notice that you were not discriminated against because of the color of your skin. You kind of have to notice it by contrasting it to somebody else, right? It's, it's very difficult to notice. Then you have ability. The, the concept of being physically able it has become so ingrained in our culture, we actually forget that most of us will go through periods of our lives when we are disabled. And especially women. Because being disabled for parts of the time during pregnancy or post-pregnancy is very common. And then we have neurotypical, and I think especially in our communities, we need to talk about that. Neurotypical is, um, is, is it, it's difficult to define because it is basically uh, the idea of, of, of not having many things, right? So, you can be neuroatypical if you have, for example, autism, or if you, if you are autistic, or if you have ADHD, or a, any kind of, of a mental health issue, maybe. Um, being autistic, and especially what they used to call high-functioning, or they now call high-functioning, they used to call Asperger's, uh, has been quite common in our communities. Um, but one thing that we haven't been very good at is accommodating people who have different types of sensitivities. And a lot of these things comes with sensitivities. Sensitivity to light, sensitivity to sound, and not handling crowds a lot, maybe not being able to deal with talking with people large parts of the day. Instead, we make jokes, again, and oftentimes you will see a lot of the latent homophobia and the latent uh, uh, neurotypical kind of, of harassment that we see is in jokes. And then we have age. For some reason, like the people who run this industry keep on thinking that 15-year-olds are the most brilliant people. And <laughs> And the most, most of us know, like we've been doing this for a while, we didn't get worse at it, right? And, and, but still, we have this tendency to, to in the industry, to, teach, to think that older people are somehow less capable. Instead of considering their experience to be something that we can learn from. Because very, very many times what we see in the industry is that we keep on going back to concepts, right? But you have things like language, I already talked about. If you speak a language well, or if you don't. Citizenship, again, it has to do with, is your residency in this country tied to your job? And if it is, it makes you vulnerable again. Religion. Socioeconomic background, we haven't talked about that. But it's having, starting work in tech, for many people, will be the first time that they end up in a tax bracket like this, right? They're, they might be the first people in their families to go to school. They might be the first people in their families to ever be able to have a savings account. So suddenly you are exposed to a different world than you grew up in. You might never have been in a fancy restaurant before. You might not have ever had excess pay. What do people do with like the stuff 
that they don't spend at the end of the month. And you can't ask your family because, you know, they didn't know either. And the, the people you grew up with, they were also poor. Then you have things like class or accent. Many countries, being of the wrong class or having the wrong accent could mean you are denied a job. Or people won't take you seriously. Or you will never become a manager because no, people like you don't become managers. And then you have education. Um, we are in a business where we actually have many really talented, self-taught people. But still, there is this classist thing between people who have a higher education and people who don't. And many places, getting a higher education basically means your family was rich, which really doesn't say much about you. But we should talk about how arbitrary privileges, because I have a bunch. I am half Norwegian, half Latin American, and I am the whitest person I have ever met. <laughs> and that means I never experienced any racism because of this. But I grew up with a bunch of kids that were also half Norwegian, half Latin American, and we had the the colors of our skins have definitely covered a gradient. But I can tell you that anyone who had any kind of tint to their skin that indicated that they were not 100% no ethnically Norwegian, they all experienced racism. I had a guy in my class who was a nationalist. Nationalist is what they call themselves, still. <laughs> He would walk me home from parties. He was worried about me like being safe. He really liked me. And he kept on saying that, you know what, you are not like them, you're different. That's not a compliment. <laughs> a lot of people hear that. And especially, you could hear that as a black woman, that people would say, oh, those people are like that, but not you, because you're different. But let's do some fun ones. Height privilege. If, as a man, if you are tall, then chances, you have much better chances of becoming rich, getting a high paying managing job, getting authority, all sorts of things. If you are just above average tall, is really great if you're a guy. So you should like call your parents. <laughs> Another one is born in January. Born in January is great, especially if you're in sports. Actually, if you look at most professional sports teams, almost everyone is born, almost anyone in the team born in the first quarter of the year. It's very interesting. What they find is, of course, that you, as you grow up, you're in your year in your sports teams, and the people are born early in the year, they are bigger than the other kids, and then people think they're talented because they were just randomly a little bit older, and then they are cultivated as talents, they keep on getting this positive feedback, and then they end up being professional athletes. So being born in January is a good deal. You should go for that too. <laughs> or how about where you're born? Some countries really suck to be born in. But you know, even if we take like the, the, the Europe and North, North America, I would basically say try to find yourself to be born in a country with universal health care. It's a good start. Uh, if you can add on being born in a country where education, higher education is free, that's also good. Here we're getting our master's degree and we're actually surviving to take it. Really good. So again, select with care where you're born. Privilege is being spared a hardship. It doesn't mean your life was great. So hopefully we've gotten to the point where, where you are starting to think about what kind of privileges you have, and then maybe starting to think about how lives of other people around you is different from your own. And what I hope is when you leave here that you will start um, 
looking into that and, and seeing people, listening to people, trying to learn more about this. But as you do that, I want to go through some patterns in pro problematic communications. And the reason for that is that I don't want you to do these things <laughs> when you go and you try to figure things out. So these are, are uh, from a thread by a woman called Erin Brooke. The first one is competitive communication style. Competitive communication style is basically where you are talking, but you're not actually learning or interested in learning, but you're interested in winning. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this technique. Uh, it's something that people do almost as a sport, uh, where you, your idea is to go in and try to kill your opponent in some way. I have an expression for this from my daughter. Uh, I say, this is from Dr. Phil. <laughs> do you want to be right? or do you want to be married? Be very careful on who you are competing with, because if your point here is to destroy your opponent, that will suck if it is your partner, right? Another thing you will see is downplaying issues and concerns, saying it's not that bad, don't overreact, come on, calm down. Then you have interpreting people of color and women as angry. And this is especially something you should pay attention to with, with men of color. It's true for women as well, but we've talked a little bit about that. Men of color have often very little opportunity to express any kind of dismay or be in any way. Because people fear men that have dark skin. So what you will often find is that men of color will be extremely kind, like ridiculously calm and nice and caring and considerate all the time. They have very little wiggle room to express their emotions because just being a little bit of a negative emotion and people will become afraid of them. And so they adjust their behavior to compensate for bias in other people. And the same thing you see with women. Women can not express emotion at work. And it's really funny because if I express only a little bit of emotion, people say I'm emotional <laughs> in some ways. Like, oh, Patricia, calm down if I have like a little bit of a tone. But then you can have a man standing next to me, screaming and shouting and banging the table and just like, and people will say, he's passionate. <laughs> <laughs> then you have not trusting women's exper experiences and expertise. And this is something that we all have to think about, men and women, because we all do this. Distrust women. And... This distrust of women is something that is very hard to shake. But so my best tip for this is basically to when you when you hear a woman say something and then you get this feeling like ah maybe she's exaggerating or framing it somehow to think okay what would I feel if it was a man that said it to me? And very often you will realize that you would have felt totally differently. So I'll give you some examples. These are named examples. And one thing that I want to point out is that they're rarely done accidentally or in good faith. Very often, <laughs> you didn't mean to offend, maybe, but you meant what you said. And they're often paired with a refusal to back off. And that's when you realize that somebody's offended or somebody's harmed by the way you talk, but then you just keep on going. So the first one is sea lining. How many of you are familiar with sea lining? Sea lining is based on a cartoon. This is the fun part of the talk where I do voices. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's based on this cartoon. Maybe I should go over here. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so for people who can't really see the picture because it might be hard to see, the, it is a man and a woman is sitting in a toy train. And so the woman goes. I don't mind most marine mammals, but sea lions, I could do without sea lions. 
And the man goes, don't say that out loud. And then the sea lion appears, of course. Pardon me, I couldn't help but over here. Now you've done it. I would like to have a civil conversation about your statement. Would you mind showing me any evidence of any negative thing any sea lion has ever done to you? Go away. There's no need to raise your voice. I'm right here. I'm just curious if you have any sources to back up your opinion. You're in my house. You made a statement in public for all to hear. Are you unable to defend the statements you make or simply unwilling to have a recent discussion? I told you, dude, sea lions. I have been unfailingly polite and you two have been nothing but rude. I'm trying to eat breakfast. Very well, we shall resume in an hour. Or in more textual description, sea lining is a type of trolling or harassment which consists of pursuing people with persistent requests for evidence or repeated questions. The harasser uses this tactic, also uses fake civility so as to discredit their target. Now, now that you have seen the cartoon, you will probably recognize it a lot. It's, it's one of those things that when you've seen it, you kind of see it all, all over the place. Then we come to mansplaining. Mansplaining is often very, very hard for men to deal with. They get very angry just hearing the word mansplaining. And so it's very important to say that mansplaining is not men explaining things. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with men explaining things. Mansplaining is spe specific behavior, a specific situation where oftentimes a man will then ex explain condescendingly a woman's expertise to her. So this is from Erin Brooks. She wrote an article based on the thread uh, from before. The technical definition of mansplaining is when a man explains something to a woman she already knows, often in a condescending tone. Of course, it's often like her specific expertise. Uh, the woman who coined the, the word mansplaining was mansplained her own book. <laughs> Very often it will be fun stuff, you know, like men explaining to women how, how periods are, things like that. Then we come to something that is very difficult for many people. So I'm going to do it with an example. When in pain, most people swear. It's an interesting thing that if you go to a maternity ward, then you will find a bunch of women that normally would never swear, swearing like sailors. <laughs> I, 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 I remember I was, uh, when I was uh, giving birth to my... Uh, my daughter and I was in the maternity ward, and uh, this woman, she was screaming, I thought she was dying, seriously, or was like somebody was murdering her. It was, I had never heard a grown woman scream like that in my entire life. I, it scared the shit out of me. And then afterwards, uh, you know, it became quiet, whatever. I walked by the room, and I see her there with the baby in her arms, and, and, and speaking to the nurse, and the nurse was like, so how was it? And she oh no, it was fine. <laughs> and I felt like, you know, this is like some kind of, they give you some kind of like a secret pill or something. It's like, poof, and it's all gone. But imagine that you did something incredibly macho, like you were chopping wood and you chopped your leg, and even with your chopped leg and blood squirting all over the place, for some reason you managed to get yourself to the hospital. So now you should be feeling very macho in all of this, and you can be swearing like a sailor because this probably hurt massively, right? So they're rolling you in, and you're screaming and yelling and swearing. And then the doctor comes over and goes like, okay, shh, shh, okay, no, okay, I know none of that language. I will not have that language here. No, I will not treat you until you calm down and you talk to me in a polite voice. It's like nobody would do that. It's crazy. But that is tone policing. Tone policing is about refusing to listening to someone because of 
the way they say it or a word they're using. And the funny thing is, if you, you can never actually make them happy. <laughs> they will always say that there's something wrong in the way that you're saying what you're saying. And by doing this, they are stopping you from expressing what you have to say. Because they keep on saying that you have to say it in a different way. But also, people who have experienced systematic discrimination their entire lives are often angry. That is totally normal. And being angry and expressing that anger is a normal reaction to an unfair lived experience. But they might say some things that might hurt you, and so you have to be prepared for that. Okay, so tone policing will go through the definition. Drawing attention to the tone rather than content of a statement can allow other parties to avoid engaging with sound arguments presented in that statement, thus undermining the original party's attempt to communicate and effectively shutting them down. This also means that you lose your chance to learn from them, right? Because they are no longer able to express what they're trying to say. Not all men is a form of tone policing. Not all men is, not only, here's an example, but you can have it for anything. Not all white people, for example. Not all white women, another good example. Basically, when someone is saying something and they're using some kind of generalization in their statement, then you pop out and go, yeah, but I'm not like that. I'm not like what you said. And there are two problems with that. First of all, this person is expressing something real. There's some, a lived experience that you don't know. This is an opportunity for you to learn. And you are instead moving the focus over to yourself. But the other one is actually misunderstanding because very often people will use generalizations but they know very well that it's not all men. It is a form of expression, and especially a form of expression when you're angry or frustrated or sad. So what can you do then? Because that's the important part, I guess. Because we started off maybe in this unconscious incompetence, thinking that privilege is a myth. Maybe not really realizing exactly what privilege is, because very often people think it's like, yeah, I was born with a lot of money, right? And then you're thinking, I don't believe this is a problem because I don't experience it. But hopefully, you come over to this. I believe this is a problem, but I don't understand it. And then you come into your learning, right? You need to listen and educate yourself. But when you do that, one thing that you have to keep in mind is that some things that you think are academic, like you think you can discuss it in some kind of academic way, is actually things that are dangerous to other people. You can talk in, in academic terms about whether or not misgendering this and that, but for some people being misgendered could cost them their lives. And it's not something that is academically interesting. It is something that is fundamentally horrifying and scary. People can become, come end up in situations that are physically dangerous to them or mentally dangerous to them for no other reason than things they can't control, like their gender, their gender identity, their sexuality, skin color, physical or psychological disability. People can be harmed. So as you educate yourself, I, one thing that I want you to do is try to do it yourself. A lot of people want these people who are marginalized to teach them. That is a massive job. And we can't put that on them. A lot of people are doing their best just to get by. So use Google, follow people on Twitter, but don't demand that marginalized people educate you. 
try to read what marginalized people put out and learn from that. Then you have the concept of lending privilege. If you have some kind of status at work, and oftentimes you think you don't because I'm not a manager, but very often in tech, your, your status at work is not tied to your uh, job title, it's tied to your knowledge. If you are the best person within certain type of field, people will look up to you. And you will have a lot of weight in meetings. If you say something, people will listen. And in that way, you can also help others. So you can partner with them. Say, I want this person to work with me on this project. You can react when they're ignored in a meeting. You can, like, one thing that you will often see, it happens to me all the time, is that I will say something in a meeting, and then nobody, everybody will, it's, it's really funny, everybody will, will be quiet while I, I say my thing. And then right after, the, it's like I never said anything. They'll just continue another conversation. <laughs> it's, it's sort of like you feel like you're invisible. It's like I, I talked, but I don't think anyone heard. I think I just kind of spoke in my head. But, but what you often will see is, you know, a couple of minutes later, uh, a male colleague will say exactly what I said. And then everybody will go, oh, that is such a great idea. We should do that. <laughs> So what you can do if that happens, and you see it, you can go like, yeah, I think it's a really good idea that you brought up what she said earlier, because I thought that was smart, right? It's not something that really does much, but it goes back where people can't ignore you anymore. Because the only way you can be invisible in the workplace is if everybody allows it to happen. If one person in the room makes you uninvisible, it's impossible for all of the other people to continue pretending you're not there. And call out your peers on prejudice. If you hear, hear homophobic stuff in the office, then just say, hey, that's not cool. It doesn't have to be a massive thing. A lot of, most, most of us can take social cues, uh, on, even, even nonverbal cues. If you just look at people with disgust, most people will get that message. And then you have things like sponsoring. And sponsoring is different than mentoring. Mentoring, you are, you are more of a teacher. And sponsoring, you are hitching your career and your status and your power to somebody else. And you are doing that by, by walking into those meetings where people are trying to pick a candidate and go, I like Joanne. I think she's brilliant. And that is actually using your power to lift somebody up. But that is also spending your capital, right? So sponsoring is much more of an investment, a personal investment in people than mentoring is. Because mentoring is basically a disjointed thing. Nobody might know that you're mentoring a person. But the moment you are sponsoring someone, people know. John said that she's great, right? OK. so. Now we're going to play a video in a second. And it is about the impact of privilege, because that's kind of hard to imagine. Because we often want to take credit for our own success. We want to think that this, what I have achieved, I worked hard for it. But very often, yes, you worked hard for it, but you might have gotten a little bit of help. And it might be that the person who is at your level, had to work harder than you to get to the same place. Okay, so let's see if we manage to play this. Take two steps forward if both of your parents are still married. Take two steps forward if you grew up with a father figure in the home. Take two steps forward if you had access to a private education. Take two steps forward if you had access to a free tutor growing up. Take two steps forward if you've never had to worry about your cell phone being shut off. Take two steps forward if you've never had to help mom or dad with the bills. 
take two steps forward if it wasn't because of your athletic ability. You don't have to pay for college. Take two steps forward if you never wondered where your next meal was going to come from. I want you guys up here in the front just to turn around and look. Every statement I've made has nothing to do with anything any of you have done. Has nothing to do with decisions you've made. Everything I have said has nothing to do with what you've done. We all know these people up here have a better opportunity to win this hundred dollars. Does that mean these people back here can't race? No. We would be foolish to not realize we've been given more opportunity. We don't want to recognize that we've been given a head start. But the reality is we have. Now, there's no excuse. They still got to run their race. You still got to run your race. But whoever wins this hundred dollars, I think it'd be extremely foolish of you not to utilize that and learn more about somebody else's story. The story behind this video is that he said that the kids, they had a race, that they were going to, the people who won the race would get $100. But before we start, we're just going to give some people a little bit of an advantage. So, let's see if I manage to go to the next slide. And that brings us to intersectionality. Because, as we've seen, privileges, they multiply. If you are white, you will generally have an easier life. If you are a man, you will generally have an easier life. If you are a white man, it's better. If you are a white straight man, generally better. But the opposite of that is also important to realize. That if you are a woman and you are white, then you are probably a lot more privileged than a woman of color. And the intersection of many different types of marginalized groups will often cause you to have more struggles, sometimes multiplied. Because privilege is being sp spared a particular type of hardship. And situations that you experience as uneventful can be hostile or even dangerous to others. And that's the thing that is important to understand, that you don't experience privilege. If you are privileged, it doesn't happen. It's a non-event in your life. But it doesn't mean your life was easy. And just means that this, this one thing didn't happen to you. You didn't have to live with this one thing. You might have had the life exactly like you did, and, it was, and you went through bad things, but at least you didn't have to go through racism every day. And as we become aware of our privileges and we start learning from others and listening to them, then we open up the possibility of becoming better people, better partners, better colleagues, better family members. And hopefully we'll make an industry where we have room for everybody. Thank you. <laughs>